question to you. Uh, I noticed that also in other countries, uh, it's trademark troll is should isn't a contradiction in terms. Of why? Um, in most, uh, in almost all jurisdictions, uh, when you file a trademark, uh, it's quite a mandatory requirement for the validity of the trademark that uh, there is a, the use of the mark or almost the intent to use of it. But um, there are various levels uh, and stages uh, for the operation of such requirement in different jurisdictions. And these uh, have uh, a very significant consequences uh, for as, as attorneys and for our clients uh, in uh, how to decide to protect uh, our rights because uh, you have to start maybe a litigation paying a lot of money or it's a good idea to reach a settlement pay maybe a fee or a license fee or a bunch of money to the trademark trawlers. I think uh, that it is important uh, uh, if we make uh, distinctions uh, between countries uh, that uh, follow common law tradition and countries that they follow um, civil law tradition. Generally speaking, all the countries that they follow common law tradition, um, the, the, the uh, requirements of the use of trademark or the intent to use uh, it's uh, uh, almost compulsory at the moment of the, the application, and uh, it's uh, still uh, uh, compulsory to file documents uh, in the application process. On the contrary, for uh, uh, countries where uh, um, they follow the uh, civil law tradition, this requirement uh, is uh, written, we can say, but is not request improper. So, the trademarks are granted without uh, necessity to file any documents to prove the use, and uh, it is only request when a third party will sue and will claim a revocation of the trademark. Then you have to file documents showing that actually you were using the trademark. I, we, now we go together, um, we will examine together some uh, cases. I will start with uh, a decision of the Court of Justice of the European Union. It is an uh, interesting case because with this case, uh, the European uh, um, Court of Justice has provided the guidance in the interpretation of bad faith. It was uh, um, on the left, on the left side, we can see the famous, uh, Europe is famous, but I think also here, um, Lind uh, rabbit chocolate uh, of, uh, um, covered by a gold foil with a red ribbon and a bell. They were using this uh, um, package and this uh, three-dimensional design, let's say, is, uh, uh, since uh, 1930, and they were especially pr selling this product in Germany and in Austria. In 2000, Lynn thought that it was a good idea to file a, a three-dimensional uh, EC trademark, and uh, after one year, this trademark has been uh, registered. Meanwhile, um, Lind decided to uh, sue an Austrian company that was uh, producing and selling another Banny, <laughs> chocolate banny, covered with a gold fold with a red ribbon at the neck without the bell. And this company was selling this product only in Austria since 1962. So quite a long time, so almost 40 years that they was selling this product. Lind started a lawsuit for uh, infringement um, for counterfeit of the trademark before before the Commercial Court of Vienna. And um, obviously, the Austrian company claimed uh, uh, the nullity of the trademark because the trademark, uh, in uh, its opinion, has been fi filed uh, in bad faith. Um, the Viennese court, uh, the Commercial Viennese court, uh, decided, accepted uh, um, the uh, counterclaim of the Austrian company and re rejected uh, the infringement claim uh, of Lind. Obviously, Lind uh, filed an appeal contesting, uh, and the, the appeal court uh, uh, says uh, that uh, um, 
rejected uh, again the appeal, but also in this case uh, uh, upheld the decision, and so they decided that the Lind trademark was valid and not void. Obviously, the two parties went to um, ask to the went to the Supreme Court, and the Austrian Supreme Court filed a request to the Court of Justice in order to have how information, how guidance, how to manage um, the bad faith uh, aspects. And the Court of uh, uh, the European Court has uh, uh, given this type of guidance that, uh, first of all, the, um, the judges, the European judges, has to verify properly uh, the, the intentions of the applicants. So if uh, the applicants file several trademarks without having a real intention to use, if uh, is lacking uh, an intention to use or a use, a proof of the use, immediately the trademark has to be considered as applied in bad faith and so has to be rejected. Another aspect that has to be taken into consideration is that um, if uh, an entity files a trademark knowing that uh, other companies are using the same trademark or similar trademarks for similar identical products, can be considered filed in bad faith only if the other competitors are not, is not compulsory for them to use a specific shape uh, or for uh, the products uh, or for the, type, for the type of products and so on. So the Supreme Court of Vienna, of Austria, has decided that uh, Lind has uh, filed, applied for a trademark in good faith because he was using for several years. He has, even if he, he was aware that there was an Austrian company uh, using a similar trademark, uh, he just filed with, with intention to protect his rights and the other company could change the shape of his products. So they, um, uh, they, 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 they withdrew, they upheld the decision of the Court of Appeal and then sentenced the Austrian company for infringement. That is a peculiar thing. Another case that I think is interesting is uh, uh, one uh, in, um, about Class A in Germany. This is one of the earliest uh, uh, cases in Europe. Uh, a famous uh, uh, car maker, uh, everyone you know is, uh, is Daimler, Daimler um, Chrysler, decided to call a line of cars Class A. When they started to, um, to introduce in the market uh, this uh, new line of car, uh, they discovered they received a cheese, a cheese and disease letter from a French guy. They say, I have registered a trademark in France and in Swiss. If you want to use this name for the car, you should pay a fee to me, a license fee. And uh, because they didn't want to have a long uh, trial and spend too much money, they thought that it was a good idea to reach a settlement. And they pay a license fee for the French, uh, French market, 150,000 day mark, and for Swiss market, 50,000 day mark. When they started to also advertise and sell the car in Germany, the guy came again and said, look, I have an international <laughs> trademark registration that is also valid in Germany. So um, I will uh, start a lawsuit for infringement and I will uh, ask a seizure uh, in, in, of your products. This time, the, um, the company, the famous auto, automaker's car, decided not to pay uh, the, any money to this uh, gentleman and start a lawsuit. This case is interesting because uh, the court uh, of German uh, stated that, uh, um, declared that the trademark registered by this uh, gentleman was void because it has been filed in bad faith. And also in this case, the court of Germany has uh, given some guidance uh, in the interpretation about bad faith. And uh, um, the court states that uh, a single entity, uh, when a single entity registers several trademarks uh, uh, for a wider 
uh, different products uh, is uh, really um, it, it's uh, an element that the, the, the trademark has been applied in uh, bad faith. In particular, if uh, after some time uh, they are not able to prove any real use or any real intention to use, it's a confirmation that the trademark has been applied in bad faith. Plus, uh, another element, and I think is the most important element, is that uh, when a trademark is so similar to another famous trademark uh, and is registered for similar or identical products, uh, it's quite predictable that uh, the trademark has been filed in bad faith. The only case uh, that I found related to sports uh, events or competition is the one uh, that I received from a French colleague. This is a quite nice uh, uh, case uh, in which, uh, also in this case, uh, a gentleman, uh, when he became a, it, when it has been advertised in the newspaper that uh, Paris, the town of the city of Paris, uh, will candidates uh, to um, um, to to host the Summer Olympic Games in 2012, he decided to file several trademarks, Paris 2012, Paris 2016, because these games are played every four years, so Paris 2016, Paris 2020, and so on, and also the corresponding domain names. Um, the city of Paris sued this gentleman, and the court states that the trademark has been filed uh, in bad faith because for sure a single entity as a, a person cannot be uh, cannot be say or give any proof of a real intention to use for summer olympic games paris 2012 because for sure it will not organize by a, a, a person but a, by the town and the second is that for sure he was aware that uh, the city of Paris was going to use uh, this type of trademark. So the court uh, um, de uh, declared void the trademark and also all the related domain names. Another case uh, uh, that uh, um, we, have, we are facing uh, is uh, in a different type of jurisdiction, uh, is a jurisdiction influenced by uh, common law tradition, India. India, it doesn't use the, uh, the definition of trademark trolling, they use only uh, the definition of bad faith, but the cases are very similar to the others, where an entity reduces a trademark uh, of, a com uh, of a competitor in order to block uh, uh, the sale and the production and the enter of the new, in the new market of the competitor. The, this case is interesting because uh, the Indian Supreme Court uh, has uh, really underlined that uh, uh, the intention of use um, has to be present uh, since at the beginning of the application. So um, the applicant has to have documents to prove a real intention to use when he applied the trademark. And uh, this uh, intention to use has to be genuine and real. So uh, in this case, it's quite difficult uh, uh, to prove uh, uh, a real intention to use uh, for a trademark trolling, even if sometimes, uh, as happens in the United States, uh, uh, the famous gentleman filed uh, fake documents. Passing to Asia, I think that everyone knows this famous case. Uh, uh, China is, uh, um, we can say that in China, uh, the trademark trolling is a phenomenon that uh, is really exploding. Uh, also because uh, uh, in China it's really cheap to file trademarks and also quite expensive to uh, start a litigation to get back the trademark. And uh, uh, China has the, one of the biggest portfolio of trademarks. Uh, just in 2005, they have just five, five, uh, um, five million trademarks. Uh, most of them are filed on bad faith or by our clients that decided to file uh, protective trademarks in different classes just to protect their business in China. The famous case of uh, Apple versus Taiwan Wegener, it was about the trademark iPad. 
uh, when uh, Apple starts wanted to enter in the Chinese market, uh, the Taiwan Weigan uh, blocked uh, is uh, entering uh, in the, um, the in the market, uh, telling that they have registered and valid trademark in China for iPad, and they were using it. Actually, it is not sure if they had the very good documents, but they had some documents. <laughs> But uh, I, Apple decides to pay $60 million and reaching a settlement to have the right to use uh, iPad trademark in China. I think that just because uh, they didn't want to lose too much time, because the cases, the lawsuit in China are quite long. It takes a lot, they are more expensive, but they are quite long. So block the business for maybe three years, uh, it will be huge, huger damages than to pay 60 million of dollars to the opposite party. Another case, uh, always based on common law tradition, but in North America, is this uh, Cerveria Modelo versus Marcon. This is in Canada. Mr. Marcon thought that it was a good idea to register several trademarks uh, um, of uh, famous uh, alcoholic uh, uh, brands uh, or liquor brands like, uh, in this case, Corona, but also Heineken, Budweiser, Avian, uh, Perrier, and so on. And uh, when uh, um, Cerveza Modelo decided to export and use and sell the, uh, the, the beer in Canada, they realized that there was a, this a famous, there was, the trademark was already registered by this uh, gentleman. The Canadian court states that uh, uh, when a single person registered the famous trademarks and registered several famous trademarks, uh, it is quite suspicious. But uh, uh, this, the, the case went in front of the Supreme Court of Canada, so it takes also time to get and to spend a lot of, to get a decision, and the Cerveza Modelo spends a lot of money. But uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, the court uh, um, decided that the trademark was applied in bad faith because, for sure, Mr. Marcon was aware that uh, the trademark was a well-known trademark. Uh, Plus, his bad faith has conferred by the, having him also file famous uh, brands of other, other com as a trademarks of other famous companies. Third, uh, during the cross examination, he was not so sure and he was not go so good uh, to prove that uh, he has uh, a real and genuine intention to use uh, the trademark that he registered. Passing to South America, um, I, I received this uh, case from a Colombian friend, and it is a quite famous case uh, between Google versus Procatex. Uh, this company filed uh, a trade, applied a trademark Google for uh, uh, 25 uh, um, for the products of 25 class, so different class from Google. But uh, Google obtained the. Um, mm, the revocation and the declaration of null voidness of this trademark on the basis of uh, notoriety and also on the basis that uh, Procatex uh, has no any real interest in using this trademark for uh, um, clothing, uh, but just to try to damage uh, Google Inc. The last case uh, that we examine together is uh, still in South America. It's about Mexico. Um, a Mexican liqueur company decided to uh, register a, a trademark in Mexico for Quesalteca, for uh, this uh, uh, famous brand in Guatemala for a liqueur. And when the Guatemala company decided to, ex to sell and export and register the trademark in Mexico, they found that uh, the trademark was already registered. The, at the moment, uh, the case is still pending before uh, the appeal the Mexican Administrative Federal Court, but uh, um, at the moment, the Mexican court uh, states that uh, uh, the use, uh, um, the, use uh, uh, the documents filed uh, from the Guatemala company to prove the use uh, were not sufficient 
uh, to prove the use and the notoriety were not sufficient. So now we will see what's happened, but at the moment the Mexican companies still uh, have uh, a valid registration for this uh, uh, trademark. Bill and I, we thought that uh, um, it was important to give you uh, a definition and where uh, trademark trolling phenomenon comes from. We thought that it was just important to give you just a rough idea how the trademark trolling bad faith are treated in different countries. To conclude, what, in our opinion, could be the best practices to protect the interest and the right of our clients. First of all, we think that we have to suggest to our clients to register the trademarks as early as possible in each country where they have business, but in particular where they, are in, they have intention to go or to have business. Because it's quite predictable that they will, then they will start to facing in this new market, they will file that someone has already uh, registered a trademark. Uh, Secondly, uh, especially for countries uh, that uh, are um, based on common law tradition, it is important that to file, effect, to file proofs of effective use. Sometimes uh, I suggest to my clients, uh, even if they are not really prepared to enter in a market, uh, to make some advertising in that country and maybe to send some products uh, uh, also maybe uh, for free, but uh, just uh, to see that they send some uh, amount of products uh, every year or they make every two years some advertising and it's uh, just that they have real intention to enter in that market. And obviously also monitoring registration all around the world because in, all, in several countries uh, it is it, it, it is a good possibility to file the opposition to the registration and is cheaper and faster than to start an ordinary proceeding for, uh, to obtain the revocation or the nullity of the trademark. Obviously, it has to be always evaluate the costs and the benefits because sometimes, as Apple did, it was better to reach a settlement. In other cases, like, for example, the Lint one or the Class A, they decided to go ahead with uh, um, litigation. Now I pass the word to Bill just uh, to... Oh, sorry. To tell you how is the, 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 the fate of the trademark trawler. So, if despite the fact you've used all your best practices, you nevertheless find that you end up in court having to litigate some of these issues, um, uh, I will talk a little bit about some of the best defenses that you can present in the litigation. Um, of course, often will be the case that you can make the argument that the registration was obtained through fraud on the administrative office. Um, now, and again, speaking of, uh, from the perspective of the United States, to show fraud on the United States Patent and Trademark Office, um, it's, not, it's not an easy um, uh, proof. Um, first of all, fraud has to be shown with clear and convincing evidence. Um, but essentially, often in the case of a trademark uh, troll, there will be uh, genuine proof or genuine uh, fraud on the trademark office. Requires a false representation, uh, but also not just a false representation, but also that the uh, applicant had knowledge of the falsity. So just simply a mistake many times there are mistakes made in trademark applications. That's not enough to show fraud. There has to be uh, knowledge of the falsity and intention to uh, deceive. Um, 
Another uh, uh, way to defeat, and this was, uh, as I mentioned in the case against Leo Stoller, uh, the defendant can show that the plaintiff, uh, the trademark troll, never really used the mark, that any use was uh, token use or no use whatsoever. Uh, so again, in, in a common law country, it will be necessary that the trademark troll has to prove actual use, and if they can't do that, of course, that's a, a defense. Kind of related issue is um, abandonment. Um, again, I, I'm speaking from the U.S. perspective. Uh, even if the trademark troll once upon a time used the mark in commerce, if they have, if they have no, are no longer using the mark, and uh, uh, and they have no intention to continue to use the mark, then that will be considered uh, abandonment. Now, a very powerful tool uh, is to obtain cancellation of the registration, um, which can be done for those uh, reasons. Uh, Non-use is a basis for cancellation. Fraud is a basis for cancellation. Abandonment is a basis for cancellation. And uh, this was, of course, as, as I mentioned, one of the key tools for the, uh, uh, the downfall of Mr. Leo Stoller. So, as I say in the Billy Goats uh, Gruff case here, also with Mr. Stoller, the troll was, was vanquished. Uh, the end of the, his story is that so many courts awarded uh, uh, penalties and attorney's fees against him and his companies that he had to go into bankruptcy. In the course of filing his bankruptcy, he made so many false statements in his bankruptcy proceeding that the uh, U.S. attorney in, the, in Chicago uh, brought a criminal proceeding against him. So he's had criminal proceedings, he pleaded guilty, and right now he's awaiting sentencing. So Mr. Uh, Stoller came to a bad end, and uh, he will probably end up in jail. So that's what happens to trolls, I guess, right? So thank you. Um, we have questions. Yeah, yeah. Before the question, just to let you know that presentations uh, will be available in the web. And uh, you can contact um, Bill or Nicoletta in the last slide of the presentation. You can find information of both of them. Yeah. Uh, yes. well, no, it's not a question, it's a, it's a comment. But uh, in Argentina, this was a common practice. And uh, back in 1981, was the trademark law was amended. Uh, there was included a special clause Article 24, which especially provides for this, uh, a solution for this situation. It provides for um, trademarks will be null and void when uh, they are filed against any provision of the law. And then there are two other uh, sections, B and C, who said that the marks will be null for uh, if someone files for each commercialization having a, a kind of a habitual practice for doing that. And the last paragraph said that uh, the marks will be null and void for uh, if someone knew or should have known that the mark belonged to a third party when he files the trademark. So it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, going to your examples, uh, this uh, involves a concept of bullying. Hmm? And probably in Spanish it would be matonería or something like that. But the courts have used sometimes the word prepotente. I don't know if you can translate that into prepotent in English or not, but anyhow, the concept of bullying. And uh, <clears throat> you were referring to cases where there is a threat of somebody who owns a trademark of bringing a court action for infringement. And on the other hand, uh, opposing the third parties' applications 
with a view to make a quick buck uh, in return for withdrawing the, the, that opposition. Now, I don't know if within the concept of uh, trademark trolling you envision a situation where somebody owns a famous trademark and is applying for that mark with an additional word which is pretty descriptive which happens to be quite similar to another registered trademark which is certainly not well known. Uh, this is being interpreted by a Federal Court of Appeals in Buenos Aires as being a sort of bullying situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the guy who owns a rather uh, unknown and obtrusive trademark and the fact that the marks when compared as a whole are not possibly confused by anyone, uh, they considered that this was a sort of overpowering action and, uh, and that it shouldn't be allowed. So that, that's, this is something you didn't bring into the picture of your, your trolling concept, but I don't know whether you would consider this fall within that or not. That sounds like bullying to me more so than trolling. I mean, to me, the concept of a trademark troll is getting revenues, uh, whereas bullying usually is more of trying to keep your territory clear and, and as broad as possible to keep other marks off the registry uh, and to stop other people from using it more so than getting money from them. But I think what you've described is, yeah, that's another uh, variety of trademark bully. I may, the other thing, I think in the concept of, of uh, trademark trolling, you, you have this uh, people who register trademarks without the intent of using that mark for the goods or services for which they have applied for them. Now, in, <clears throat> in a country like Argentina, uh, you, it's perfectly legitimate to register defensive trademarks. So you find people who own uh, very famous marks and in certain goods, and they res register them on goods, non-related goods or non-related services uh, with a purpose of protecting people from trying to uh, take a free ride on these, uh, these right, rights. So uh, in countries like the US, that you have to rely on concepts like dilution of the famous notorious mark or whatever, but in other countries like ours, you can register defensive trademarks 